Good morning. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of our panelists and other guests. Today we will be further examining our proposed procedures for addressing small rate cases. This proceeding reflects the second step in the Board's efforts, begun by my fellow Commissioners, to use its rulemaking authority to reform the rail rate dispute resolution process. In October of 2006, we concluded the first step in that initiative by revising the methodology used to address large rate disputes. We have now turned our attention to the task of reforming our procedures and standards for smaller disputes. Through this proceeding, we seek to bring some certainty to the questions of who has access to the small rate case process and how a case will be handled by the Board once a complaint, once a complaint is filed. I recognize that there has already been an extensive record developed in this proceeding, both through two prior hearings as well as through the large amount of comments received on the proposed procedures. I look forward to hearing your testimony today, particularly with regard to the issues that were noticed in our January 22, 2007 decision. I'm especially looking forward to hearing your views on the eligibility standard as proposed in the initial rule, as modified in our January 22 decision, or any other alternatives you might have. It is my goal to finalize procedures that are accessible, workable, affordable, and fair to all parties. On a separate matter, I'd like to make a public service announcement about the STB's relocation plans. As many of you are aware, we will be moving to a new headquarters located at 395 E Street Southwest sometime in, uh, they tell us, in uh, late February or more likely early March. Please note that we will not only have a new address, but new phone numbers as well. Our, e our email addresses will remain unchanged. We'll keep our website updated with the current information so that you will know how to reach us. I believe that you will enjoy our new space, particularly our public spaces, the library, the hearing room, and the filing room, which will be readily accessible. I'm sure this will be music to folks' ears to, to this morning after waiting for elevators, as I know we all did. Uh, accessible on the ground floor. While, we, while we'll do our best to minimize disruption during the move, you can expect that normal business operations will be suspended for approximately two business days during the move. During that time, we will not accept normal case filings and our email system will be down, but we will make certain that the agency can be reached should an emergency, uh, emergency situation arise. I also understand that our library's contents will be inaccessible over a two-week period immediately prior to the agency's move. We will provide details in the press release that will be issued shortly, and you can keep your eye on our website for further information. Now, before we begin, let me just take a few minutes to review a few procedural points about today's hearing. We will hear from panels with breaks as appropriate. We will hear from all the speakers on a panel. Speakers, you will see a green light when you have one minute remaining in your allotted time, and a red light when your time has expired. After hearing from the entire panel, we will rotate with questions at five minutes per board member until we've exhausted the questions. Consistent with board practice, we will allow all the witnesses on each panel to make full presentations before the members ask any questions. Finally, just a reminder to please turn off your cell phones. So with that, I certainly look forward to a very interesting day of testimony. I know I have some questions, and I'm sure that my fellow commissioners do as well. And with that, I will recognize Vice Chairman Buttrey for any opening statement uh, he may have. Vice Chairman Buttrey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this exercise is uh, sort of reminiscent to me of the attempts on the part of the Congress from time to time to revise the tax code. Uh, the tax code, I don't know how many pages it is, but, but uh, someone I think said it was 13,000 pages at some point, and, and the bill to revise the tax code was 23,000 pages. So uh, this, this effort has turned into a, a Herculean task, it seems. Uh, this is the... Uh, volume of comments that uh, that we reviewed for this hearing today and we're looking forward to uh, hearing all the all the witnesses that will appear um, we obviously have to do what we're doing because the Congress told us we had to do it and we'd probably be doing it anyway but uh, uh, I am very concerned personally about uh, the situation that's presented by uh, the issues in this case uh, they've been of interest to me even before I came here when I started to uh, learn more about uh, rail regulation, and uh, they're of great interest to me, and I'm particularly concerned about shippers having uh, access to uh, a system that allows them some opportunity to address their concerns. 
And so that's going to be one of my major concerns as I listen to the testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Mulvey. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman Nottingham. I'd like to uh, join Chairman Nottingham and Vice Chairman Buttrey in their remarks. Uh, the Congress has directed the Board to develop procedures that would allow shippers the value of whose case would not justify bringing a case under our full standalone course guidelines to have access to board review of railroad rates under less costly procedures. Now, this issue has been before the board and its predecessor agency, the ICC, for over 20 years. <clears throat> and those making relatively small shipments are still without meaningful access. And this is simply unacceptable. I share the frustration of those who have long waited for the board to clarify the current guidelines. Now, we have issued a notice of proposed rulemaking, and we have received a great many comments from shippers, railroads, trade associations, and government agencies. And because of the extent of these comments, and because addressing many of them would entail significant changes to our proposed final rule, it is important that we have today's hearing before going forward. The stakes are simply too high not to get it right. And whatever the specifics of the final rule is that we adopt, it must satisfy three fundamental criteria. First, it must meet the congressional directive that we make our procedures accessible to virtually any shipper whose traffic is regulated by the board to bring a case if he or she believes their rate to be unreasonable. In the comments we received, many shippers suggested that the proposed eligibility criteria would make it impossible for most shippers to justify bringing a case. I want those shippers to know that we hear their concerns and that we are taking them very seriously as we work towards a final rule. I hope that some of the new approaches we discuss here today will go a long way towards ensuring that we meet the spirit of the Congressional Directive. Second, any final rule must be able to withstand judicial review. Adopting a rule that will not be accepted by the courts will only further delay the establishment of a workable solution. And finally, the rule must recognize the economics of the railroad industry and the right of railroads to charge rates via differential pricing that will, in aggregate, allow them to cover costs and earn a fair return on invested capital. This is a tall order. It has required a tremendous amount of time and effort on the part of the board staff, and for their continued dedication to this cause, I commend them. In addition, I want to applaud the staff for their very difficult and critical work that they recently completed on the fuel surcharge issue. With that, I look forward to hearing the testimonies from today's witnesses, and with those inputs, I am hopeful that we can soon come to a final rule. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Mulvey and Vice Chairman Buttrey. We'll now uh, proceed <coughs> with the panels. Our first panel is um, a panel of one uh, from representing the United States Department of Transportation. I'd like to invite Paul S. Smith to come forward and address uh, the uh, board for five minutes. Welcome, Mr. Smith. Uh, it's uh, good to have you here. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Nottingham, Vice Chairman Buttrey, and Commissioner Mulvey. My name is Paul Samuel Smith, and today it is once again my <coughs> distinct privilege to represent the United States Department of Transportation. The Service Transportation Board in this proceeding continues the very difficult task of finding ways to provide meaningful opportunities for shippers to seek regulatory relief from rail rates that is considered to be unreasonably high. The only process and standards today in use for that purpose, the standalone cost methodology, both incorporates fundamental principles of railroad economics and constrains the pricing of carriers who are otherwise in a dominant position with respect to their shippers. The problem, of course, is that the SAC methodology is far too expensive for all but a handful of cases. Mindful of the fact that the Department does not participate in individual rate adjudications, and is therefore without some of the practical knowledge held by those who do. I want to fairly, excuse me, I want to briefly summarize the department's basic position. First, of course, we applaud the very serious effort underway to adopt useful standards for shippers and carriers. The board's proposals to simplify and streamline rate cases have real promise, but they do require further clarification and particularly explanation or demonstration to show how they would work in practice in order to answer all manner of questions particularly those concerning the relationship uh, between the outcomes in SAC cases and those that would arise from the pending proposals and their variations. Moreover, to the extent simplification entails increased reliance on broad industry costs, the accuracy and reliability of the regulatory ERC system that is the repository of that information becomes all the more important 
and so therefore warrants updating. We have also expressed reservations about the proposed eligibility standards for each alternative to SAC, the simplified SAC, and the modified three benchmark options, and to the estimated cost of pursuing rate cases. We strongly favor mediation as a preliminary step in all cases generally. More recently, the Board has asked parties to focus today on potential refinements of its original proposals, which refinements were put forth in response to comments already received, and I'll turn to these now. First, the Department supports further exploration of limiting the amounts recoverable in rate cases based upon shippers' identification of the actual value of their cases rather than upon their maximum value. Second, we favor elimination of the aggregation rule, subject to revisiting that subject if there is actual evidence of manipulation by shippers in order to qualify for less expensive and less accurate alternatives. Third, the Department does not believe that language in 49 U.S.C. 10701D3, by its terms, limits the Board to a single non-SAC alternative. In these circumstances, the Board has ample discretion to interpret and apply the statutory language within reasonable bounds. The Department also supports the presumption that the predominant route should be used in simplified SAC cases. Not only would this reduce costs, but consistent use of a route by a railroad should tend to reflect its most efficient or optimal route. Shippers, however, should be free to offer rebuttal evidence of demonstrably more efficient alternative routes. Finally, the Department does not favor limiting the source of comparison groups for use in modified three benchmark cases to defendant railroads only. The purpose of this exercise is to identify a sample of shipments with similar characteristics. Shippers may well need to draw shipments from several railroads in order to obtain a sample of sufficient size. We do, however, consider that comparison groups should not be drawn from traffic moving pursuant to contracts. The array of terms and the interrelationship of services, rates, and other conditions render contract traffic qualitatively dissimilar to non-contract traffic for comparison purposes. That concludes my brief prepared remarks, and I'll be pleased to try and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Smith. If I could just lead, I'll be brief. You mentioned in your remarks that the appropriate interpretation of the statute need not constrain us, if I heard you correctly, to looking at just one SAC, one SAC alternative. That's our view, yes. Could you expand on that a little bit, just to make sure I understand fully what you had in mind? We think that Congress would have been far more stringent, far more careful in its use of language in the statute if it had intended for you to have only one alternative to the SAC methodology, which, of course, covers such a very, very small percentage of shippers and shipments in the country. It's more reasonable to expect that, with the language they do use, in our opinion, that they allow the board leeway to adopt reasonable measures that would encompass the very many thousands of shippers and the kinds of shipments that they have, and that one size or just two sizes doesn't necessarily fit all. Thank you. Just one more question. Near the end of your remarks, you discussed the distinction between contract traffic and non-contract traffic, and the Department's view that contract traffic should not be considered as part of our analysis in these cases. Would that position change if a greater, substantially greater proportion of overall traffic were to be moving under contract? I mean, if you got to a point in time where, I don't know, just pick a big round number, 75 percent of traffic were to be moving under contract, could you get to a point in time where not looking at contract traffic doesn't prevent you from having sort of a statistically significant sample, so to speak, to look at? I couldn't foreclose that at this juncture. Certainly, one could hypothesize a situation in which it would be statistically extremely difficult to accumulate a valid enough sample size if such an overwhelming portion of traffic moved according to contracts only. We don't believe that's the case now, and so under the present circumstances, we just would not favor the use of contract traffic for these comparison groups. Thank you. Vice Chairman Buttrig? No questions. Commissioner Mulvey? Just briefly, 
It's been suggested that uh, we test our proposals for the three benchmark and the, and the simplified SAC proposal uh, before we adopt them, or if we do adopt them, test them before we apply them. Um, do you see how the board could actually test these before we apply them, and would the department be able to assist the board in whatever cost uh, will incurred in testing these uh, proposals? We would be very willing to assist the board in any of these demonstrations. Um, we think it is important because in this case, although, as I've said, we don't have the um, experience that comes with pursuing these cases ourselves, um, those who do have put before the board in the record um, virtually a parade of horribles, totally different, of course, as to what might happen if this variation or that variation were adopted. Um, we're somewhere in the middle. We don't know for sure how it would work out, but we think that since especially one of the um, main purposes, if not the main purpose of this entire proceeding, is to expand the access, which now really doesn't exist. Um, it is to uh, encourage participation, predictability, and so forth. But the only way that could happen, in our view, is if the board uh, does indeed conduct some demonstration projects to show how it would uh, select a sample of comparison group, and how it would, um, uh, how, in a, how one issue adopted or not adopted would affect the outcome and how the parties are able to see, therefore, as well, how the outcome would change and how close it would be or not close would be to an SAC kind of outcome. Mm -hmm. One of the difficulties is we probably would have to do uh, several of them in order to show that under different circumstances we still replicate as closely as possible the SAC outcome. So it could Granted. be a, a long and expensive proposition. Thank you. Just that uh, Commissioner Mulvey's question uh, stimulated one more for me, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you for your patience. On that issue, that very question of uh, whether or not uh, the board should test uh, a, uh, a simplified uh, SAC uh, process before uh, implementation, could you uh, help me think through the benefits of that with any um, experience that the department might have in the context of your many complex rulemakings uh, on difficult issues. I know, uh, I know from my time at the department there are a few over there across the modes. And uh, does the department have some examples of, of testing um, uh, rules uh, to give stakeholders some peace of mind as to exactly how uh, uh, they would be implemented uh, once the rules are finalized? Um, at this moment, I personally do not, but I'd like to seek permission to perhaps get back to you as soon as possible on that. I can make a quick survey of the various modal administrations. I know that we don't, we are predominantly either a grant or a safety agency, um, and therefore I guess I would project that we probably don't have too many, uh, if any, rate-making kinds of uh, responsibilities, but let me um, do a quick check and see if there's anything that might be useful for you. Please, that would be helpful if you could, I, and I, I will note that the, this, the record uh, in this proceeding will be open for uh, some time. Uh, the dates uh, keep me in. T towards the end of the month, I believe it's the 26th of February, it's, it's uh, posted. But so uh, that would be helpful if you could. Thank you. Certainly. Any other questions from colleagues? Uh, seeing none, uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. Appreciate your time. Um, and, uh, thank you. We will now uh, bring the next panel up uh, representing um, uh, three uh, groups. Uh, first, uh, and for um, uh, the, uh, the longest period of time, we have a, uh, an interested parties uh, group, a, a joint shipper group, represented by Nicholas J. DeMichael, Andrew P. Goldstein, Thomas D. Crowley, and Gerald W. Fouth III. Uh, also, uh, the National Grain and Feed Association, represented by Dan Mack, and representing the National Industrial Transportation League, Doug Kratzberg and Mr. Kurt Warfel. Welcome to all of you. I'll give you a minute to uh, get settled there. Uh, we appreciate your participation this morning. And uh, we will be, uh, I believe, starting from uh, our left, your your right uh, end of the uh, the panel, and working our way across. If that uh, works for the for the group, good. Uh, with uh, without further ado, let me uh, call on Mr. Warfel. Will you be taking the lead on, from, from your team? Okay. Please proceed. And uh, I note that uh, you have uh, ten minutes. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Kurt Warfel and I am the Manager of Logistics and Distribution at Echa Chemicals. I am also the Chairman of the League. 
Uh, with me is Mr. Doug Kratzberg, Rail Planning and Operations Manager at Exxon Mobil Chemical Company. Mr. Kratzberg is the Chairman of the Lakes Railroad Transportation Committee, composed of over 100 league members who are particularly interested in rail transportation. First, I want to commend the Board for initiating this proceeding. The league participated in the proceeding which led to the adoption of the current guidelines in 1996 and has testified on the subject before the Board and Congress since then. While we are pleased that the Board has taken action, we have very serious concerns with the current proposal. We believe that the changes that the Board has proposed will be of no value to almost all shippers and will likely worsen rather than solve the problems with the current rules and standards. The League's views are contained in the comments of the interested parties to which the League subscribed, as well as in separate comments that the League submitted. Although the Board should consult these documents for the League's detailed views, key elements of our position include the following. One, the League supports the Board's general concept that there should be a bright line eligibility standard for small rate cases with an opportunity to consider individual circumstances. Two, the Board should withdraw its simplified standalone cost proposal. Three, the Board should revise and increase its maximum value of the case or MBC eligibility threshold for full SAC cases to $13.5 million. If the Board retains its simplified SAC standard, the MV3 threshold for such cases should be $10.5 million. All cases with an MVC less than these thresholds should be litigated under the three benchmark procedure. Four, the Board should eliminate the aggregation rule. Five, the League supports the Board's proposed revisions to the three benchmark standard, although it believes the Board should permit the introduction of other evidence. Six, the League supports the Board's proposal to use unadjusted ERCs in determining the three benchmark standard. And seven, the League generally supports the Board's proposed procedures for three benchmark cases, but we believe the Board should permit a complainant access to information they need before the complaint is filed. The League also supports the Railroad's suggestion for an expedited mandatory mediation process. Now I'll talk just a few moments about some broader issues and concerns that have been raised by this case, and Mr. Kratzberg will discuss some of the practical problems we see with the Board's proposed rules. Shippers need an effective, simple, and expeditious method for resolving rate disputes. Most non-coal shippers do not transport sufficiently large quantities of goods in consistent volumes between the same two points for a long enough period of time to justify bringing a full standalone cost case. Moreover, because of the uncertainties in the current small case rules, shippers have been reluctant to enter into costly litigation when their eligibility for simplified procedures is unknown and when the likely outcome is far from clear. Thus, many shippers now have no effective way of satisfying their commercial need for a simple and expedited method for resolving rail rate disputes. But the issues in this case are not just about the resolution of commercial disputes. It is also important relative to the continued use of rail transportation in the future. Unless rail shippers believe they can fairly, quickly, and at a reasonable cost resolve rate disputes, they will be unwilling to put their full confidence in rail transportation. They will ultimately find ways, as best they can, to avoid a mode where they have few commercial options and where they cannot resolve disputes quickly and effectively. In a globalizing economy, it is more and more possible for them to manufacture goods elsewhere and ship finished products back here in containers. Now, obviously, the cost of rail transportation is only one of many factors to determine whether goods are made here or abroad. But make no mistake, it is a factor in the decision. Rail shippers have an increasing need for a simple and expeditious method of resolving rate disputes. It is no secret that rail rates have been increasing rapidly as rail capacity has become constrained. The fact that prices go up when supply is tight is to be expected. Our members understand the laws of supply and demand. After all, they are in competitive markets and deal with this reality every day. What is different about the rail industry is that for many shippers, there are few competitive options to serve as a check on market power abuse. When there is no competition, how high is up? A balanced and effective regulatory review will provide an answer to that question to everyone's benefit. The existence of a fast and simple method for resolving rate disputes will not result in a wave of litigation. Indeed, the very existence of a meaningful method to resolve rate disputes could be a vital tool to help shippers and carriers avoid those very disputes. 
Meaningful rate standards would permit shippers and carriers to predict a narrow range of probable outcomes from a case. This would provide incentives to both parties to reach a commercial agreement based upon that range, anticipated litigation costs, and risks. Conversely, the lack of a meaningful method for resolving rate disputes does not eliminate those disputes. It merely submerges them, channeling them into unproductive commercial relationships and into increasingly urgent calls for legislative action. And I'll turn the discussion over to Mr. Grasper. Thank you, Kurt. I'd like to speak for a few moments on some of the practical aspects of the Board's small rate case proposal. As you know, the Board has proposed small, medium, and large case procedure. Litigation under the existing large case stand-alone cost procedure takes three to four years and costs approximately $4 million. The new medium case procedure, which the Board calls simplified SAC, is a less complex version of the full SAC procedure, but it will still take approximately 18 months to litigate. NITLEG is aware that there is disagreements over the cost of the simplified SAC procedure. However, a large number of organizations, including the League, have submitted testimony that the litigation could cost well over $1 million. The small case category will cost much less and is proposed to take nine months. Now, regarding eligibility that Chairman Nottingham and others have talked about already this morning, the Board's proposal establishes eligibility according to the concept of the maximum value of the case, or the MVC. If the five-year MVC is more than $200,000, then the shipper is presumed to be ineligible for the small size complaint procedure. Similarly, if the five-year MVC is more than $3.5 million, the shipper is presumed to be ineligible for the medium size complaint procedure. These proposed eligibility standards will prevent virtually every shipper from filing a case under the small rate case procedures. A movement of less than two car loads per month will likely move the shipper into the medium case category, a dispute that will require at least a year and a half and hundreds of thousands of dollars to resolve. Similarly, a movement of less than one car per day will likely move the shipper into the large case category, which by the Board's own estimation will take three to four years and cost several million dollars. The League believes that the Board's eligibility standards are off the mark, and from a shipper's perspective, they will provide relatively, basically no benefit. Now, regarding the period of time to litigate a dispute, the time required to litigate a dispute under the Board's proposal, the time required for bringing a full stand-alone cost case renders the procedure useless for virtually all shippers, as I just mentioned. The same is true of the simplified SAC procedure. Litigation over a rail price that takes a minimum of 18 months would not be very useful to virtually all shippers. That leaves the proposed small case procedure, which is proposed to be 270 days or less if there are no disputes regarding eligibility. The League would like to see that time period reduced to 180 days or less. As noted in the League's comments, a clearer eligibility standard would easily permit shortening of the proposed schedule. On behalf of NIT League, Mr. Werfel and I have both remarked on the usefulness of the Board's full stand-alone cost procedure. With regard to the simplified SAC procedure, a large group of industry associations have retained experts that have presented testimony to the Board that the cost for presenting a so-called simplified stand-alone case is many multiple times higher than the Board has estimated, likely well more than $1 million. If the number is anywhere close to that figure, or if there is a substantial uncertainty as to what the litigation cost will be, this will severely chill any desire for shippers to bring rate disputes to the Board. I cannot close without talking briefly about the complexity to the shipper of the Board's proposed simplified stand-alone cost methodology. While perhaps these procedures are simplified compared to the stand-alone cost procedures, the proposed simplified SAC procedures are not simple under any definition of the word. The Board itself needed a 24-page single-spaced appendix to explain just how to calculate two aspects of this simplified calculation. The existing small case procedures have the benefit of being grounded in comprehensible facts and numbers. Firstly, comparable rates. Second, rates and costs necessary to achieve revenue adequacy. And third, the amount of high-rated traffic on a railroad. In contrast, the Board's so-called simplified SAC procedures depend upon the calculation of a make-believe railroad, which quite frankly doesn't exist. 
from a shipper standpoint is far better for the board's maximum rate standard at least in smaller cases to be grounded on real and understandable facts in conclusion while the league welcomes changes to the small rate case methodology the league is disappointed by proposed revisions the board's eligibility presumptions for both the small or both the medium and the small case procedures are set so low as to effectively eliminate any chance that a smaller rate case would be brought before the board. Many rail rate disputes would fall into extremely expensive, lengthy, and complex full standalone cost procedure. Those that don't would fall into the proposed simplified SAC procedure that is also extremely complex, uncertain, and expensive. In summary, the League recommends a number of uh, uh, proposals as Kurt outlined, and I won't go through those again, but Based on the, the testimony that we've provided and the written comments, we believe the League's recommendations effectively address the need to implement procedures that will result in an effective, simple, and expeditious method for resolving rate disputes. Further, they guard against market power abuse and improve shipper access to the board, which I'll note were also items of, of comment in Mr. Hamburger's uh, press release back in December when he uh, commented on, on shippers' uh, uh, input into this case. So I thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll now proceed with uh, Mr. Dan Mack from the National Grain and Feed Association. Welcome. Please proceed. Chairman Nottingham, Vice Chairman Buttrey, and Commissioner Mulvey. The National Grain and Feed Association appreciates this opportunity to present its views on simplified standards for small rate cases. My name is Dan Mack. I am currently chairman of the National Grant of Feed Association's Rail Shipper Receiver Committee and vice president of transportation for CHS Incorporated. NGFA's 900 member companies handle over two thirds of the grains and oil seeds that are commercially marketed and processed in the United States. However, the re regulatory significance and economic impacts of this proceeding extend well beyond NGFA's core membership to the hundreds of thousands of farmers that sell grain to our member companies and to the U.S. and international customers that purchase food and agricultural products. NGFA's opening submission in this case was supported by 40 agricultural organizations representing the vast majority of U.S. agricultural interests involved in grain and oilseed production and marketing. The strong interest from agriculture in this proceeding is driven by the knowledge that the United States competes with many other global suppliers in destination markets that forced the production marketing chain to absorb much higher transportation costs to remain competitive. That means that a high percentage of increased transport costs are borne by the farmer through prices paid in local markets. We know of no other STB or ICC proceedings since the Staggers Act was passed that have garnered this much public attention, as it has become clear that current, rule, current rules make regulatory review of rates beyond the reach of ag shippers. High rail rates are not, pervasive, are not a pervasive matter that affect everyone in agriculture. Indeed, an analysis of the 2005 Waybill sample that NGFA submitted in next party 665 indicates that less than half of raw agricultural commodities were shipped at rates above 180% of variable cost. 7.5% of agricultural commodities were shipped at rates exceeding 300% of variable costs. However, in real numbers, tens of thousands of carloads of unprocessed egg commodities are at rates over 180%, and the number is increasing rapidly. Grain products are in the same position. In those situations where high rates may pose a problem, either in terms of excessive costs to shipper and farmer customers or by creating a barrier to market access, reasonable regulatory oversight is necessary and clearly required by statute. NGFA's view is that the three benchmark approach to the STB rate oversight is much more likely to be useful to agriculture shippers than the simplified standalone cost procedures, provided that the 3B eligibility standard is reasonable. Cost experts estimate that bringing a simplified standalone case cost case will impose costs of at least $1 million and likely much higher. Coupled with the odds that winning some form of rate relief is probably no better than 50-50, it is very unlikely that an agriculture shipper could ever justify bringing a simplified standalone cost rate case on any specific movement. Thus, the remainder of our comments will be directed at the 3B approach. For 3B cases, 
the STB has proposed, proposed an eligibility standard of $200,000 as the maximum value of a case over a five-year time horizon. In our original submission, we illustrated why this extremely low level of eligibility virtually precludes any case being brought. Of the two cost experts that analyzed the expected cost to bring a case, the lowest estimated expense number to conduct the cost analysis was $115,000. Adding expected legal fees to this number virtually assures that the theoretical maximum payoff from such litigation could not reasonably be expected to cover the expenses of bringing a case. This calculation does not take into account the litigation risk, internal cost of employee time, business relationship risks, and other costs and risk factors that would have to be overcome to justify a rate case. Most of the carrier's testimonies tend to be supportive of the STB's $200,000 threshold proposal as reasonable. But very significantly, both departments of the federal government offering testimony, those being USDA and DOT, seriously questioned whether this number was considerably too low. DOT stated, the board should consider whether the financial amounts proposed for small and medium cases would be quickly exceeded. USDA stated, USDA believes that the proposed eligibility criteria ceiling for medium size and small rate appeals procedures in the simplified standards are set at much too low. As a result, the expected cost of pursuing a rate appeal would often exceed the expected benefits, precluding shippers from challenging unreasonable rates. We agree with DOT and USDA that the eligibility standard for 3B cases is obviously much too low and may be the most significant single matter before the STB in determining whether access to rate relief is actually being offered for small rate cases. The possibility is raised in the January 22nd decision that the board might drop a hard and fast aggregation rule and take a new approach towards litigation costs or steps in the right direction. But the board should do everything within its power to ensure that there is a financial, realistic, and worthwhile remedy available for every unreasonable jurisdictional rate. NGFA does not favor setting the bar to rate relief so low that excessive litigation might occur. However, for a number of reasons, we heavily discount the possibility of an avalanche of litigation. We draw this conclusion because beyond the expense of legal costs, legal and cost experts, there are many other barriers and risks that might be factored into businessmen's decision whether to bring a case. Those factors include internal costs, internal business costs of employee and executive time, the fact that upfront money will have to be invested by shippers for cost experts even before a realistic assessment can be made of the probability of winning and potential outcomes, the risk of souring the business relationship with the carrier, uncertainty regarding how much time a case will require, the longer a case proceeds, the higher the cost, the uncertainty of a possible court appeal of an STB decision, the probability of winning, which is likely no more than 50 percent, and lastly, if the case is successful, the likely amount of potential rate concessions, which in all likelihood is a mere fraction of the theoretical maximum case value. For all these reasons, we anticipate that under any reasonable eligibility standard, the use of small rate guidelines would be limited. Since 1998, NGFA also has experience in administrating an arbitration system for railroad and rail customer disputes, which may offer some insights on what might be expected if the STB lowers the bar on small rate cases. The NGFA rail arbitration system provides for dispute resolution on a wide range of issues. All Class I carriers and several regional and short-run carriers remain a part of the system through a voluntary commitment to abide by compulsory arbitration. This rail arbitration system establishes a much lower bar to dispute resolution than what is being proposed by the STB under even the least costly 3B approach. And yet, in its eight years of existence, the NGFA's rail arbitration process has generated only six completed and published cases. This low number is not an indicator that the private rail arbitration system has not been useful or successful. To the contrary, I believe that most rail shippers and railroads alike would agree that the system has been extremely successful as a business tool to encourage private negotiation of disputes. Because the system exists, it permits either the carrier or the rail customer to easily and inexpensively initiate an arbitration proceeding, which often leads to more serious negotiations in an expedited fashion. 
When both sides have an incentive to negotiate, litigation can often be avoided. And that is exact, exactly what has happened with the NGFA arbitration. But the business incentive to negotiate must exist. And if it doesn't naturally result from a competitive marketplace, it must come from another source. We would submit that the STB can provide some reasonable business incentives to negotiate where those incentives may not exist today. By developing reasonable rules and eligibility standards for small rate cases and therefore provide federal government support for, negotiated, for a negotiated market solution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mack. If I could just ask the witnesses to make sure you're uh, speaking close into the microphone. We've, I've seen some evidence of some straining ears behind you and, and uh, up here as well. Just I know sometimes these mics can be extremely loud, as mine seems to be this morning, and other times they can be a little less loud. Um, thank you. We'll go to the next uh, panel, which is a um, unusually long uh, panel with allotted some, uh, 45 minutes of time, but for very good reason, the, uh, as we'll hear, I'm sure, the uh, uh, range and depth of uh, organizations and uh, interests uh, represented by the uh, by the coalition, the interested parties joint shipper group is quite uh, broad and so we did want to accommodate their request. Uh, we'll start now with uh, 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 Andrew P. Goldstein and then I see that uh, Nichols J. DeMichael will actually be the first uh, uh, witness from this panel. Please proceed. Good morning, uh, Chairman Nottingham, uh, Vice Chairman Bud Buttrey, Commissioner Mulvey. I am uh, Nicholas DeMichael. I appear here on behalf of the interested parties. With me is Mr. Andrew Goldstein, who's co-counsel for the interested parties. And uh, also with me are Mr. Thomas Crowley and Mr. Gerald Foth. Mr. Crowley and Mr. Foth are cost experts whom the interested parties have retained for this uh, uh, proceeding. The interested parties uh, are composed, uh, as you know, of 38 separate national and state associations and other parties we're vitally interested in this uh, proceeding, and they include a very broad array of uh, shipper uh, 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 interests. First of all, we want to thank the board uh, for the opportunity to testify, and we want to thank the board uh, for initiating this uh, proceeding. While the interested parties have some very serious concerns with several of the board's uh, proposals, we're very pleased that the board has begun to attempt to develop uh, better rules for small rate cases. As the previous speakers have uh, uh, noted, uh, there is a great need uh, for a procedure uh, for adjudicating smaller uh, rate disputes, and we uh, very much welcome this uh, chance to discuss this matter with the board. We've read that with great interest the board's recent decision that posed a variety of questions, and we'll try to address a number of those in our testimony today. However, I would note that we have not had the chance to analyze all of the ramifications and the questions in the board's recent order, and thus we'll be submitting uh, further comments after the hearing as permitted by the board's uh, decision. Um, our presentation today will be in uh, uh, several parts. Uh, Mr. Goldstein will first present uh, uh, several legal and uh, policy issues, particularly those raised in the board's recent uh, decision. I will then discuss uh, the interested parties' uh, position on the substance of the board's proposal in this proceeding and again attempt to answer a number of questions posed in the board's recent order. And that presentation will uh, deal, uh, first of all, with uh, the eligibility matter, Secondly, we'll discuss uh, the board's proposed uh, simplified SAC uh, proposal, then the changes to the board's three benchmark uh, standard, and if we have time, uh, we'll get to uh, some of the procedural uh, questions raised. So that's kind of the order that we're, that we're think, thinking of here. And I'll be calling on both Mr. Crowley uh, and Mr. Foth uh, at various points in this presentation. Uh, I would note that we're frankly here to answer your questions, and we brought Mr. Crowley and Mr. Falk to the table because we thought the board might have some technical questions regarding uh, the interested parties' position that they would be in a best position uh, to answer. So uh, when the time comes, we uh, certainly welcome questions. Um, without uh, further ado, let me turn uh, to Mr. Goldstein, who will discuss uh, first uh, several of the key legal and uh, policy issues in, in this case. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, I'm going to uh, address two areas of general concern. The first is the issue raised in the board's January 22 decision about the three-tier approach and whether the statute can be satisfied merely by adoption of a simplified SAC procedure as, a, as proposed by Union Pacific or instead whether a simplified benchmark approach is necessary which is our view. And the second issue 
is the recurring railroad theme that the board must, at almost any cost, preserve railroad revenues in this proceeding. The most direct answer to UP's argument is that simplified SAC does not satisfy the statute with or without a three benchmark alternative. The statute, as you know, demands a simplified and expedited process. And simplified SAC is neither simplified nor expedited. And if it doesn't meet both tests, it fails the statutory measure. A year and a half, which is the timetable proposed for simplified SAC, is not an expedited process, even if one made the totally unrealistic assumption that the 18-month timetable would be met, which has never proven to be the case with any full SAC timetable. An 18-month timetable seems especially inappropriate when there is a truly expedited process available to the board in the form of a three benchmark approach that will take nine months from beginning to end. And neither is simplified SAC truly simplified. It may be simpler than full SAC, but that's not the same thing as simplified. The so-called simplified process is still a highly complicated case, as Mr. Crowley and Mr. Foth will explain. The process involves a major factual undertaking, extensive and detailed cost analysis, and calculations requiring expert consultants. If the process were truly simplified, it shouldn't take 18 months. The proposed schedule for completion of the record in a simplified SAC case is 12 months, compared with just seven months under the board's rules for completing a record in a full SAC case. And the 18 months that has been proposed for completion of a simplified SAC case is two months longer than the 16 months now scheduled in the board's rules for completion of a full SAC case, which hardly suggests that the new process is simplified or particularly expedited. The position of the interested parties with respect to the three-tier approach is that there is no support for it in the statutory language and that there is no support for UP's position in the legislative history. The statute clearly measures the availability of a simplified procedure against a full SAC case, but the proposed rules measure the availability of the three benchmark process against the standard that is not full SAC. The boundaries drawn by the board in effect say that the benchmark process is unavailable if the so-called simplified process will do the trick, even if a full SAC case is too costly for the value of the benchmark case. And that is simply contrary to the statute. Union Pacific seems to think it can obviate that entire issue by convincing the board to do away with the benchmark test and retain only what is called the simplified SAC process. The trouble is that the simplified SAC process by itself does not satisfy the statute, in part because it is neither simplified nor expedited, and in part because it will leave too many shipments without a rate remedy unless the board wants to pretend that a simplified SAC case can be brought for well under $200,000. The fact is that it will cost well over a million dollars, even before adding a cushion for what the board has recognized as a necessity to make sure that a complaining shipper recovers more than its mere costs of litigation. There are a number of assumptions one can make about the implications of a million dollar plus simplified SAC case cost. If, for example, a one and a half million dollar cost is spread over five years, it allows recovery of a case value of $300,000 per year. No one's going to be bringing these expensive and risky cases in the expectation of recovering a mere $100 or so per car, so I'll assume a recovery of $500 per car in rate reduction. What that means is that the benefit of a simplified SAC case on those assumptions would be exhausted at the level of 600 cars per year. 600 cars in the grain industry amounts to slightly more 
than five 110-car unit train annually, or only a part of what a facility can ship. If a facility ships more than that number of cars required to exhaust the case value, it loses access to rate relief altogether unless there is a three benchmark alternative available. UP's proposal taking away the three benchmark process would leave that elevator without effective relief. Also, the board should not overlook the fact that the statute reflects a full awareness on the part of Congress when Section 10701D3 was enacted, that there was a proceeding that had been pending before the board for many years to establish an alternative methodology to full SAC, and that was Ex Parte 347 Sub 2. Section 10701D3 actually commanded the board to conclude that particular proceeding within one year, which is what the board did in 1996. In Ex Parte 347 Sub 2, the board was expressly giving favorable consideration to a benchmark process quite similar to the benchmark approach that UP wants the board to jettison. In its 1995 decision in Ex Parte 347, the board in fact gave only passing consideration to an AAR proposed simplified SAC approach that was not a benchmark process, and it rejected that simplified approach because it would have skewed the results in favor of the railroads by failing to take all operating efficiencies into consideration, just as the board now proposes to do under simplified SAC. It would be something of a stretch to accept UP's argument that Congress intended the board to adopt the type of solution at this time that the board had refused to adopt in 1995, just before Section 10701D3 was enacted, and to jettison the benchmark approach that Congress knew the ICC had viewed favorably. The history of Section 10701D3 clearly shows that the board is not bound to adopt only that type of simplified process that applies constrained market pricing or SAC principles. The board's 1996 decision reflects that very conclusion and it remains legally sound today. Section 10701D3 entitles the board to adopt a simplified and expedited alternative to full SAC and the board should do so. Now the boards argue that, the, excuse me, the railroads argue that the board should carefully contain the availability of the truly simplified benchmark process and even any simplified SAC process because to do so, to do otherwise will erode railroad earnings. The railroads point to Table 2 of the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking to suggest that large segments of their traffic are potentially subject to rate reductions. Table 2 of the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking has been thoroughly discredited by Mr. Foth and Mr. Crowley in their written statements. Beyond that, however, the railroads' claims are nothing more than a chicken little, the sky is falling type of argument. There is absolutely no reason to believe that every single shipper whose rates are over 180 percent of variable cost will bring a rate complaint or succeed if it does so, which is the basis of the railroad industry argument. In 1995, in Ex Parte 347, the ICC found that 18 percent of all rail shipments would be eligible for rate complaints and then went on to find that mere eligibility is a far cry from actually commencing a case. In its own 1996 decision, the board similarly rejected what it called the railroad's doomsday analysis, and the board should again do so. Further, unless the railroads know something we don't know, even if every jurisdictionally eligible shipment matured into a rate complaint, it is impossible to measure any railroad industry rate reduction that will result. Neither simplified SAC nor the three benchmark approach has been tested. The board should not succumb to another railroad industry effort to suggest that effective rate regulation will be harmful to the railroad industry and instead should install a simplified and expedited remedy whenever full SAC is too costly, which is what Congress intended. And I'm turning back to Mr. DeMichel now. 